Well, if you have a Bible, and I hope you or somebody around you does that you can look on with, let me invite you to open with me to Mark chapter 11. Feel free to use table of contents if you need to. Mark chapter 11, and as you're turning, I want to welcome those of you in other locations, as well as those of you physically unable to be with us who are online. It's good to hear God's word together and then respond however he leads us by his spirit Many were together on Friday night for a prayer gathering here at Tyson's from across our locations, and the Spirit of God led us so well to, in worship, in confession of sin, in cleansing from sin, in intercession for each other. I, I've shared this before, I'll put it back up here on the screen. You can go here at any point so QR code, website, text, share to that number. Share stories of how you see God moving among us in, through our lives as we are seeking him all the more during these days. One of my favorite moments Friday night was from a testimony somebody shared through this avenue from the last couple of weeks. So to summarize, uh, there was one couple who came, went to dinner with another family on Friday night, the De Los Santos family. Um, and I, little Isaiah De Los Santos has cerebral palsy. And uh, this couple who was having dinner with the De Los Santos family uh, uh, was coming to the prayer gathering and said, hey, is there anything we can pray specifically for? And they just shared that Isaiah is not yet spoken a word, and they're just praying that he would be able to speak, start speaking words, and that he would be able to start walking in this gate they have for him. So this couple, uh, Paul and Lily, they prayed just for those three hours we were together. They said they were just praying nonstop. And a couple of nights later, they got a text from the De Los Santos saying, I don't know what you guys were praying, but don't stop because Isaiah said his first words. And he had spoken, like literally spoken mama and then other words flowing from that and he started walking in his gate. And the Del Santos family was, was there on Friday night holding little Isaiah and just sharing what God is doing and we gathered around them and just prayed over this little boy, and uh, I, I love seeking God together yes. and uh, seeing God move in ways that can only be explained by his hand and only be attributed to his glory. And what yes. a privilege we have to come before him and be a part of what he's doing. Yes. This is awesome. So let's, let's not hold back from any of that. I want to encourage you especially, so we're entering into uh, Holy Week. Uh, so this Friday night, seven o'clock here at Tyson's from across all our locations. We're going to gather and we're going to kind of combine what we've been doing in our prayer gatherings with commemorating what happened on Good Friday 2,000 years ago when Jesus died for our sins. So it's going to be a really special night. I encourage you to prioritize being here on Friday night. And then of course, Sunday is Easter. And so I'm going to put up on the screen, mclanebible.org slash Easter. You can find out all the information about service times at different locations there. There's a devotional you can download for you either individually as your family to use this week. And then there's resources uh, that can help you invite others to come with you next week. I want to urge you to bring somebody with you next Sunday who either doesn't know Jesus or is far from Jesus, maybe professed faith in Jesus at one point, but it was a long time ago, to the extent that it is in your power. Actually, more importantly, the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you. Don't come alone next week to a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. I shared in an email that went out this last week I just think of two stories of people who come to know Christ over the last couple of weeks. So we've been praying, seeking God. One man who was addicted to drugs, who came to faith in Jesus. Another woman who has spent all of her life in, as a Buddhist, who came to faith in Jesus over the last couple of weeks. And both of those people came to faith in Jesus because somebody invited them to church. Amen. 
When we invite people to hear the gospel, God shows the power of the gospel. So, follower of Jesus, like people expect you to invite them to church on Easter. They're almost offended if you don't. So, just don't offend people this week. Like, invite people. <laughs> and let's trust God to show the power of the gospel. That's actually where we're going to land in our time in the Word today. I, I love this Word. And I want to show you how it is remarkably relevant to our lives and the world today. People say the Bible's antiquated. And in one sense, it is. It's been around for thousands of years, which is kind of the point. I, I was, I was uh, with Francis Chan, so pastor, author, friend of mine who loves Jesus. And he and I were speaking together last week on a college campus. And at one point, we were just talking about the authority of God's word. And I want to show you what he shared with those college students, because I really just can't put it better than he did in this moment. So I want you to watch this clip. We'll pick up with him. He's talking about being in Israel recently with his son and daughter before he was about to send them out on their own. So watch this with me. My son, one, my son was going off to Africa. My daughter was going off to the Middle East, you know, and I thought, okay, I want one last time with them. Um, this is my 18 and 17 year old and we're, we're standing on the Mount of Olives. I'm like, I want to take you to the Holy Land. I just want to show you around. And, uh, and towards the end, we're standing at the Mount of Olives. I'm going, this is crazy. Like, this is a real place. I want you to get this. This is not like Wakanda. This is like a real place you fly to. And because sometimes this can feel like make-believe. I'm like, no, we're here. Jesus literally ascended from here. And we're looking back at Jerusalem. I'm going, look right down there. You got to understand, this is the same spot that Abraham took Isaac. Isaac. This is the same spot that David took the ark. This is the same spot. We were just in his palace where he saw Bathsheba. This is the same spot that Solomon built the temple, where the second temple, this is where Jesus was crucified. There's all of this history. We just walked through Hezekiah's tunnel. We just walked through a 3,000 year old tunnel that you can read about right here in Chronicles. Like all of this history. And, and, and you'll be tempted, I was telling my kids, to leave 6,000 years of history. People have passed this truth on for 6,000 years. And then your friend, who's 17, came up with a thought yesterday. And you're going to go with that because he's your friend and he's so wise. All those hours of Fortnite just got his mind like with so much revelation that you'll go, you know what? All the believers for 6,000 years and the morality they taught, it was off. And I was telling him and I, and I read to them Psalm 81 verses 10 to 12, look at what it says. I am the Lord your God who brought you out, up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. So, listen to this, I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. You see the punishment of, I go, look at what he's saying. He says, man, I, I was going to fill your mouth. I was going to give you all this, but you didn't want to listen to the word of the God who said, let there be light. Like my words weren't enough for you. He goes, so you know what I'm going to do? I'll let you follow your own stubborn hearts and I'll actually make you follow your own counsels. This is how I'll raise up a generation. You don't want to listen to my word? I'll start making you listen to other people's words, human words, because you don't tremble at my words. 
And it'll actually make sense to you that where, where you'll go, you know what? I follow this guy on Instagram because he's a great athlete. Oh, that makes sense. I'm, I care about what he thinks about morality because he can throw a ball really far. That's actually going to make sense to you. Or she had great plastic surgery done, so I'm going to follow her counsel. And I'll actually tremble at what she has to say. God is saying, you don't want to listen to my words. I'll make you listen to each other's words. You guys, this is not like a cool thing to do. To, to latch on to these new thoughts from famous people. And ditch, because I, I go, yeah, your friends will say, I'm old fashioned. I'm still holding to that old book and I'm going, yes. I'm not just, I'm ancient. I'm, I'm holding on to truths that are 6,000 years old rather than these thoughts that just came out of your mind. You know, and I, and I told my kids, I don't care if everyone on earth right now believes something that was contrary to what is taught in this book. I'm not going to believe the most, gen, you know, depressed, suicidal generation in history, even if they all agree on something, when the word of God has held true for all of these years, it came out of the mouth of God, and I'm going to tremble it, I'm going to declare it, and I'm not embarrassed of it, you know? There is nothing like this word in all the world. It's, it's why we gather together in a way that doesn't make sense to a lot of people, to open up a book and read it together. Because this is the word of God passed down for generations century after century after century, thousands of years. And it is remarkably relevant to our lives and the world right now, just like it has been for generation after generation in nation after nation. I want to show you this today. Like, just think about this last week, as we've seen a tragic, evil, and all too predictable script play out yet again, like another school shooting, followed by all kinds of people shouting, often with vitriol, their opinions and their perspectives about these policies and those politicians. And to be clear, for people whom God has called and requires to do justice, we care a lot about policies and politicians. We work hard to protect people, particularly the vulnerable. But if we're not careful, especially in this city, the capital of our country, where there's so much focus on our government and lawmakers and policies and politicians, we are in danger of missing the whole point. This is where the Bible and the text we just so happen to be in today is so relevant and helpful and needed because in the passage we're about to read from 2,000 years ago, the Jewish people were being oppressed by an unjust Roman Empire, and they were looking for political solutions, namely a political savior who would deliver them. They were wanting a king who would save them from their political enemies, a political messiah who would restore a political kingdom to Israel. And momentum was building around Jesus as many people thought he's the one. He's the Messiah. And by that they meant he's the political savior we've been waiting for. So let me show you what happened. 
Mark chapter 11, verse 1, look at it in this book, or if you don't have this book, you can follow along on the screen. When they drew near to Jerusalem, it's talking about the disciples of Jesus, to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, same place Francis was just mentioning, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and we'll send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing, untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. It's a picture of political kingdom. Hosanna in the highest. When he looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. So... Here's this text, which just so happens to be our next text in Mark on the day when we are celebrating Palm Sunday. And the reason why it's called Palm Sunday is because of this picture in verse 7 and 8 that we just read. As Jesus sits on this colt and comes into the city of Jerusalem, many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches. John 12 tells us they were branches of palm trees. Here's why that's significant, because palm branches were symbols of political might and military victory. A generation before Jesus, people had waved palm branches before another leader named Simon Maccabee who led a military campaign to drive Israel's enemies out of Jerusalem. So they're thinking, now Jesus is going to do the same. But the way Jesus enters into Jerusalem makes clear that he is not the kind of king they thought he was. He's not the kind of king they wanted. Instead, He was unlike any other king. And he was the kind of king they needed. And in a world and in a country, in the capital of our country, where people are already lining up to say, what kind of politician or president we need in the days ahead? What kind of policies we need to save our country? And again, those are important questions and conversations to dive into. But far above it all, and I mean infinitely far above it all, we need to lift our eyes to the king who can provide what no policy, politician, or president can ever provide. If you're taking notes, write this down. One, we need a king with authority and power over sin in this world. This is the kind of king we need. And the first clue we have in this passage that this king is unlike any other in the history of the world is when Jesus sends his disciples to find a colt for him to ride on, and its owners are going to ask, why are you doing this? And the answer is the who? The Lord has need of it. The Lord, that's the title for God. God in the flesh riding on a colt? Well, that's exactly what the prophet Malachi had written 500 years before this. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. The Lord whom you seek will come to his temple in Jerusalem. The messenger of the covenant whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. The Lord will come to the temple in Jerusalem. That's exactly what's happening in Mark chapter 11. Even more specifically... Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, had prophesied. Again, 500 years before Mark 11. 
Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Zion in the Bible is a reference to the people, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is often referred to in the Bible as Zion because Mount Zion is the highest, most prominent hill in Jerusalem. So Mark tells us about Jesus coming into Jerusalem on a cult as a fulfillment of what Zechariah had written five centuries before. Inhabitants of Jerusalem, rejoice and shout because your king is coming to you. And what is the first description of this king? He is righteous. He is perfectly just. He is one in whom there is no evil, no sin, no injustice. He is righteous. Is this not what we most need in the world? Not another sinful politician or president, imperfect policy developed by sinful people. What we need is a just and righteous king with all authority over evil and injustice. We need a king with authority and power over sin in this world. And we need a king with humility and compassion for sinners in this world. Amen. Not only is he righteous, he is, Zechariah 9.9, 9, humble. Mm -hmm. Don't we all long for a humble king? Amen. Just think about a king and a coronation. He'd be hailed and honored and revered feared, dressed in ornamental, regal attire, surrounded by splendor and pageantry. That's not the picture we have in Mark chapter 11. Jesus is surrounded by lowly Galileans coming into the city with not riches, but in poverty, not in majesty, but in meekness, humble and riding on a colt, which I'll come back to in a minute. But I, I want to read to you how Luke describes this moment as Jesus rides toward Jerusalem. Listen to Luke 19, verse 41. When Jesus drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus knew that these inhabitants in Jerusalem were about to reject him, about to crucify him, and not long after that, Jerusalem would actually be destroyed. So what does Jesus do? He weeps over the city. He cries. It's a king who is crying passionately about the people he sees. Isn't this what we need? A king who not only has power over sin, but who has compassion for sinners, which, to be clear, includes all of us. It is so easy in weeks like this when we see such evil in others to lose sight of the seriousness of sin in us. We can compare ourselves with people who do those things or even groups of people who think differently about those things than us. And in the process, 
we can totally lose sight of the depth of depravity in each of our hearts. Ladies and gentlemen, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the problem in the world is not those people with those issues. The problem in the world is not outside of us. It is inside of us. G.K. Chesterton once read an article entitled, What's Wrong with the World? And he responded to the editor with a short note that said, Dear Sir, I am yours truly, G.K. Chesterton. We all, without exception, whatever you may look like, however you may identify yourself, whatever your profession or preferences or perspective may be, we are all sinners who have turned aside from God and his good, wise ways to ourselves and our own evil, foolish ways. And we all need a king who not only has authority and power over sin, but who has humility and compassion for sinners. Which leads to the ultimate picture of what we need. We need a king who can save us from our sin. Which is why these crowds are shouting in Mark 11, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. The word means save us. The reality is, though, they had no idea the depth of what they were saying. They didn't just need to be saved from political enemies. They needed to be saved from their own sin. It's a quotation from Psalm 118. It says, save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is what Zechariah 9.9 9 says. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he. And you put this together with the timing of Jesus entering Jerusalem. It's Passover week, the time when God's people traveled to Jerusalem to celebrate the day when God saved his people from slavery in Egypt, when God brought his people salvation through the blood of a spotless lamb. Jesus is entering the city with no sin in him. And five days after this, on Good Friday, he will go to a cross. Why would we call this Good Friday, the day when God in the flesh was crucified by sinners? How is that good? It is good because he is paying the price for our sins. We need a king who can free us from the payment and penalty of sin. We need a king who will make a way for us to be forgiven by God, accepted before God, and restored to God. We need a king to save us. And the story doesn't end there. You just keep going. We need a king who can give us peace with God. Amen. Now, come back this picture of Jesus riding on a colt. It was not uncommon for a king to ride on a donkey or colt like this. The key was when a king would ride on a donkey like this. If a king was going to war, he would ride on a war horse as a picture of power. But when he was not at war, he'd ride on a donkey as a picture of peace. Which now starts to make sense, doesn't it? When Luke tells this story of Jesus coming into Jerusalem, he notes, Luke 19, 38, the crowds didn't just shout, blessed is he is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. They shouted, peace in heaven glory in the highest. We read earlier 
what Luke writes right after this, when Jesus was weeping, he said, would you, would that you, even you had known on this day the things that make for peace. And do you remember the prophecy from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 10? I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak what? Peace to the nations. Uh, one of my other favorite, moment, favorite moments from our prayer gathering Friday night, we just went around the auditorium at one point and shouted out the names of nations where we had lived just in that auditorium. And it felt like we covered most of them. It was so beautiful from Bolivia to Qatar, from Russia to Ukraine, from the kingdom of Saudi Arabia to one person shouted out Alabama, the kingdom of Alabama. It's, it's not another nation, but it's pretty different from Saudi Arabia. So we'll count it in that way. Like, and we just thought together. Just think of all the places, even right now, that we've lived. There's a king who has power to bring peace to all of them together. Amen. That's the whole scene in the end of Revelation. A multitude that no one can count from every nation, tribe, people, and language. What are they doing? They're singing the same song. They're enjoying the same king. And just picture it. I mean, just picture two of those countries, Russia and Ukraine. Just, there's a king who has power to bring peace. There's a king who has power to bring peace to the nations. In a world of evil and wickedness and strife and conflict and injustice and war, we need a king who will bring ultimate peace with God that leads to peace with one another. Which, to make the connection, was not what people were expecting in a political messiah with military might. They wanted a ruler who would wield his power and overthrow Israel's oppressors. Just like we want rulers who will wield power and crush enemies. We're drawn to them. But Jesus is a different kind of king. He came not wielding political power, but bringing spiritual peace. Isaiah 9, 6, he's the prince of peace. And he comes not crushing enemies, but loving them. All of them from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth, to all nations, to every generation, to a generation today, as Francis mentioned, is, that's drowning in anxiety and depression. We desperately need a king who can give us Which leads to the last picture I'll show here. We need a king who can heal our hearts. In the end of this passage, Jesus enters into Jerusalem and he goes to the temple and he looks around at everything. At the heart of the Jewish people's worship. I'm going to save the de full development of this one for the weeks to come as we look at what Jesus did in the temple during those days. But the bottom line is this. This was a people whose hearts were sick and desperately in need of healing. And ladies and gentlemen, so are ours. In the world around us, just look at the headlines. In the country around us, just look at the headlines. But don't stop there. In this room and in all the places we're gathered, we desperately need one who can heal our hearts in a way that no politician or president, policy or rule or regulation can do. Our greatest need is not these things. Our greatest need is new hearts. You need a new heart. I need a new heart. We all need 
new hearts. And there's only one king who can take sinful, broken, weary hearts and make them new. His name is King Jesus, and he's the one we need. He's the one we need. He's the one every single person in Metro Washington, D.C. needs. And every single person in our country and every country needs. And can I just remind us? This king came the first time riding on a donkey, a colt. But ladies and gentlemen, one day this king is coming back, and that scene is going to be a lot different. Let me show it to you, Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, with a capital F and a capital T. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire. On his head are many diadems. He has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe, dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, and white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Mark it down. Jesus came the first time to be crucified as king. Jesus is coming back to be crowned as king. And every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess in every nation that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's king to the glory of God the Father. The question is, then, for every single person in this room, in this gathering, different locations? Are you living your lo- lo- life under the lordship of King Jesus? Is it clear in your life that Jesus is your king? Yes. And if the answer to that question is not a resounding yes, then I urge you today There's coming a day when you will bow the knee to Jesus as king. The question is not will you bow. The question is will you bow now or will you bow when it's too late? And I want to urge you to bow to King Jesus. Follow this, not because you have to, but because he is the king you need. Because this is where life is found in a world of evil and injustice in following the king with power and authority over sin, with humility and compassion for sinners who can save you from all your sin, bring you peace with God, and heal your heart and make it new. Yes, bow to this king and experience life. Follow this, not just as a citizen of an eternal kingdom, as if that's not enough, but experience life as a son or daughter of the king himself. So, I urge you today, trust in and follow Jesus as king and when you do, for all who know Jesus is king. Can I just give you a word of exhortation flowing from this text and a question? First, the word of exhortation, especially for us in this city and country as another political cycle is already gearing up. I plead with you based on the Word of God. As you have opinions and convictions about policies and politicians, live with far greater passion and commitment to loving and leading people to King Jesus. 
Yes, as a people called to do justice, let us think well and wisely about how to promote goodness, protect the vulnerable around us. Let's even share our thoughts with others in a spirit of honor and humility with compassion, realizing that even brothers and sisters in Christ may disagree on these opinions and convictions at different points. Yet let us all live with single-minded passion, zeal, and with commitment to loving people of all kinds around us and leading all kinds of people around us to the king that we need. If we are more passionate about our political positions in our country than we are about people's salvation in eternity, then we, like the crowds of Mark chapter 11, will completely miss the point. Live to love and lead people to King Jesus all over this city. May that be the fragrance of our lives. We're just living to love and lead people to King Jesus. Which leads to the question, who will you share Jesus with this week or invite to come with you next Sunday? And I want to invite you to answer that question in the next couple of minutes. Maybe even to write down names of people that come to your mind. Who in your sphere of influence think family members, friends, co-workers, classmates, neighbors, acquaintances that you just so happen to know and to realize what if God has put these people in my life for me to love and point them to King Jesus. And if, if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus and you're starting to get a little, I don't know, weirded out by like, are we like, like targeting you? Or like, what is, what is this about? I just, I would encourage you to think about it this way. What if it's true? Just imagine for a moment it's true. That 2,000 years ago in history, Jesus died on a cross to pay the price for your sin and then rose from the grave, conquered death. And anyone who trusts in Jesus will be forgiven of their sin and have eternal life with God. And anyone who doesn't, when they die, will spend eternity in suffering separated from God. Now I know that for some that may be a big leap, but just imagine for a moment it's true. If that's true, wouldn't you want somebody to be intentional about sharing that with you? inviting you to hear that, at least. Like, if somebody believes that and doesn't share with you, that doesn't show they don't love you very much. That they clearly don't care about you if they're not willing to share that with you. If they know that your eternity is dependent on hearing and believing in Jesus, and they're not even telling you about him, like... So hopefully that gives a little perspective for those of you who are not in Jesus, and hopefully it gives some perspective to those who are in Jesus. God, give us hearts that weep over those who don't know Jesus in ways that lead us just this week and the opportunities we have all over the city to share Jesus or invite people to come with you next Sunday. So I want to give you a moment just to think about this question, pray about this question right now at all of our locations. And then I and other location pastors are gonna lead us to pray accordingly. But let's just start knowing when we invite people to hear the gospel, God will show the power of the gospel. Who? God, right now, just 
Speak to our hearts by your spirit. Put names and faces on our minds. Who are you calling us to share Jesus with this week? Or invite to come with us next Sunday. Just consider that question prayerfully right now. Okay, God has put names, faces in our minds. So let's right now intercede for those people who just think people who don't know Jesus or who are far from Jesus. And let's intercede for them right now. Just picture Exodus 32. We read this a week or two ago in our Bible reading, Moses stood in the gap. He prayed for people who were under God's judgment. And in response to Moses' prayer, God saved that people. In response to his prayer. So let's stand in the gap and pray and believe that God hears our prayers and will bring about salvation through our prayers. So this could play out in different ways. Certainly, you can, during this time, just pray on your own, silently where you are. At the same time, I, I think it would be good, if, to the extent which you feel comfortable and be willing, just to turn to a couple people around you, one person, two or three people around you, and pray together. Just stand in the gap together. Let's all across this room lift our voices and pray for people that we long to see come to know Jesus over the next week. And pray for boldness for each other to share with them, to invite them. So can we just do that right now all across this room? Again, you feel free if, if it's best just to pray on your own, but to the extent in which you'd be willing, turn to somebody around you, a few people around you, just get together and start praying right now. Just dive in, praying, interceding for people who don't know Jesus. So go for it. Let's just spend a few moments right now coming out of this word, praying that God would use us to lead these people to King Jesus and lift them up specifically before God. Go for it.
Oh God, you hear our voices, our hearts, see our hearts as we just lift these individuals before you, these people, family members, friends, co-workers, classmates, neighbors. God, people, you love every single one of these people. God, you love them so much. You've given your son to die for them. You desire all of them to be restored to relationship with you. So God, we pray, please, Bring about your salvation in their lives. This week, God, we ask. God, we pray that you would give us boldness by your spirit in us to share the gospel this week, to invite people this week. We pray for your compassion in us. God, we, we pray that you give us the heart of Jesus. And we know you, you're, the spirit of Jesus is in us. So God, cause us to weep over those who don't know you. God, we pray that you'd forgive us for not weeping over those who don't know you. God, give us hearts that cry passionately for these people in our lives to know you, to know your love, to be saved from sin and judgment and to experience restoration of you for all of eternity. God, we pray, please bring it about. And God, we pray that you'd soften hearts and open eyes. Do what only you can do, God. Break through objections. Some of these people we've been praying for for years. God, would this be the week? Please, God. God, we, we pray this across our city. We pray for multitudes of people to come to know you, Jesus, this week in our city. We pray for spiritual awakening in our city, for unexplainably soft hearts, for a supernatural drawing to you in our city. Please, God, we pray this not just for our church. We pray this for churches all across our city that are proclaiming the gospel. We pray for your blessings on them. We pray that they would all be full next Sunday and full with people coming to know Jesus. In fact, let's let's just do that now. Let's pray for churches all across our city. Can we just call out? Let's just shout out names of different churches all across this room that are preaching the gospel, that we pray God will bless for the spread of the gospel, that many people will come to know Christ through these churches over the next week. Let's do that right now. Just, just call out the names of different churches out loud. Yes, God, bless all these churches, we pray. All the pastors proclaiming the gospel in those places. All the members of these churches filled with your Holy Spirit going out this week. God, we pray that you would bless churches all across our city for the exaltation of King Jesus. We're so glad that we are not in competition with any other church that's proclaiming the gospel. We are so thankful to be a part of family, a kingdom that's much bigger than any one church. God, cause your glory as king to be made known in all these churches, we pray. And in our churches together, all across our city and and among the nations, let's let's do what we were doing with a smaller group even on Friday night. 
Let's just call out names of nations. We'll, we'll do it similarly. Just nations where we've lived in this room. Let's call out those nations and just as we do, just in a spirit of prayer, Cause your name, Jesus, to be hallowed among all these nations. We pray for people in all these nations to come to know Jesus this week. Let's call out the names of different nations where we've lived. King Jesus, speak peace to all these nations. Spread peace in all these nations, the peace that can only be found in you. God, we pray for your blessing on churches in all these nations. We pray for salvation of people we know in these nations, God. Give us faith as we're praying these things. We're not just talking like... Just throwing out words that we're interceding, we're standing in the gap, and that you use our prayers, you hear our prayers and answer our prayers, that you will show your glory in our city, you will show your glory among the nations as we pray. God, thank you for this privilege. We pray, God, do it. Show your glory in this church, in other churches, in our city, among all the nations this week in astounding ways that can only be explained by your hand. Draw people to King Jesus. Even as I pray that, with our heads bowed and eyes closed just around this room, I know that in a room this size, there are some of you, when I asked that question earlier, are you living your life in submission to King Jesus? Some of you have never put your faith in King Jesus. Others of you who maybe, maybe you followed Jesus as King at one point in your life, but it's been a long time, and you're far from King Jesus right now. So I want to invite you, if you want to say today, I want to place my faith in Jesus as king now. I want to bow the knee now, not when it's too late. Or I want to come back to Jesus as king in my life, either for the first time or for the first time in a long time. If that's you, with our heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want to pray over you and I invite you. If that's you, either for the first time or for the first time in a long time to follow Jesus as king, would you just lift your hand up where you are? If that's you, if that describes you, just lift your hand up before God. This is not intended to be for others, just you saying yes today. I want to put a stake in the ground and follow Jesus as king of my life. I come back to Jesus as king, amen. Praise God. God, I pray over all those who are raising their hands. God, you know what is going on in their hearts and their lives because you love them. You are passionately pursuing them. God, I praise you for their humility, boldness to say yes. Today is the day for those who are trusting in you as King Jesus for the first time. God, may they know that by faith in you, Jesus, that they are forgiven of their sin and restored to relationship with you for eternal life, that you so love the world. You gave your one and only son that whoever believes in him, trusts in him, will never perish but have everlasting life. 
All glory be to your name for bringing salvation in this room and for restoring others to you, bringing others back to you. God, we praise you that you don't give up on your people, that you pursue your sons and daughters and pray that as they come back to you, they would not do so with head held low in shame. We we read in our Bible reading this morning, Psalm 3, you're the lifter of our heads. May they know they are welcome back at your table, welcome in your family with a head held high, clothed in the righteousness of Jesus, who forgives all our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Oh, Jesus, we love having you as our king. We love seeking you and worshiping you as our king and proclaiming you as our king. We say today, we shudder to think of where we would be in our lives and where we would be in the world right now if we did not have the assurance that you are king over it all. So we want to praise you, worship you, exalt you as king.